Today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and we are so grateful to have Ms. Levy here to share her story. Um, Ms. Levy, when we read the article that you worked on with Ms. Wildman, it was um, inspiring to see the connections that you made from your past to your present. And what I take away from it is how precious every moment of time is and to make the most of it. We are so thrilled to have this time with you this morning. And without any further delay, I turn it over to Ms. Wildman and Ms. Levy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good morning to everybody. Everybody okay? Yeah. I think they're muted. So okay. I just want to introduce you further um, to everybody. First of all, also, I'm Sarah Wildman. I'm a mom of Orly, who's in sixth grade. And I also am an editor at the New York Times. And I had the honor of working with Toby Levy, who's with us today, on her essay that ran earlier this month on her experience in the Holocaust and also what it's been like uh, during COVID. But we're going to talk to Toby Levy about her experience in the Holocaust. Toby grew up in a town, which we'll ask her about in a moment, that is now Ukraine, but was then Poland. Um, and she was hidden for a number of years with her family during the war as a child. And in fact, she was, when the war began, she was eight. But let's talk to her a little bit about that. She's these days, she's a docent. That means a volunteer coordinator with the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City. Some of you may have been there. And she often lectures to students. And she's told me that she actually likes speaking to students more than anybody else. Uh, and it's, she's just a joy. You guys will love her because she's just a lot of fun and filled with life. And every time I talk to her, my only sadness is that we can't sit together and eat something because that's clearly what we should be doing. So without further ado, uh, Toby, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I want you just to start by telling us where you were born. I was born in Khodorov, that's a Ukraine, now it's Ukraine, when I was born was Poland. I spoke only Polish. I was born the year, kids, you better listen. I was born the year Hitler came to power, 1933. By the end of the session, I want to know if you figured out my age. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> so you were born in 1933, and actually the first people to occupy the town were Russians. Right. In 19, when Hitler went to war, he came to power in 1933. In 1939, he went to war against all, the, all of Europe. He occupied Poland, there, no problem, one, two, three, and he split Europe with the Russians. The Russians occupied half of Europe closer to the Eastern border and Poland, which is closer to the German West was occupied by the Germans. I was occupied from 39 to 41, 1941 by the Russians. On the other hand, my husband, he lived closer to Germany. He was occupied from 39 on by the Germans. When they walked into Germany, to Poland of his town, they took all the mail to labor camps right away. Where I had the freedom because I had the Russians in 41 till ninth from 1939 to 41. Okay. So the town you were from, as you've told me, was small, but it was about a half an hour from a town that people might have heard of, which is now called Lviv, and it was then called Lvov. Cool. And it had a train station and a factory. And your father had the good fortune of being friends with everyone, which helped him when the Germans came in in 1941. Tell me what happened when the Germans came in. When the Germans came in in 1941, we lived in the center of town in a square. It was a marketplace. Small villages would come into that square. Like you see a, a market here, you, you have markets, outdoor fresh fruits and markets. That's a marketplace. They'd come and sell their fruits and vegetables and whatever else and buy what they need and go back to it. So that's a square. Most Jews lived next to each other. I call it, they made their own ghetto. It was comfortable to live between your own because it's comfortable, let's face it, you have the synagogue, you have your family. So we all lived in the center of town. We had the synagogue not far. 
So when the Germans came in, they asked all the Jews to come in the center of town, center, and to hear what they have to say. So everybody, 90% were living in center. They went to center. Like my maternal grandmother did not live in the center. They lived close to the train station because they had a little dairy farm. They produced dairy, they had fresh cow, fresh milk. So they did not come because it was a little bit of a walk. They didn't think it's a, we knew what's coming. Let's put it this way. We knew the Germans are coming. It's not going to be good, but nobody understood the depth of it. We just didn't understand. Don't forget, we did not have the same communication that we have today instantly to know what's going on. It's the phone, it's Facebook, FaceTime, it's Instagram, it's, it's everything. No, we had to wait if people ran away from Germany, German side, to tell us what's happening there. However, even if we did know, there was no place to run. Because any place to run, you needed a visa. And nobody gave visas. Even the United States, when they gave us visas, they said to their own people, don't fill them up, postpone, postpone, postpone. So when the Jews came out, we knew it's bad, but no one did understood how bad it's going to be. They, they, were, they were German dressed elegant. I was kind of short. I was at the time eight years old. All I could see is the boots, the German fancy boots. These boots are still in my life forever. Elegant German soldiers, but their voices screaming and yelling giving us order. We are no longer citizens. Jews were citizens in this area for generations and gen my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. All of a sudden, no one has any rights. Whatever you have is ours. When you go in the street, you have to wear an armband, five inches, and in the center, a blue star. You have to make it yourself and wear it on every garment. Every man and woman has to go to work. No one was talking what to do with children. Children were not important. They do what you want with them. My, so one more thing the Germans did, which they did it systematically in every town, dehumanize you. Besides the orders that I gave us and the tone of voice, not a tone, normal tone of voice talking, but orders that like, we are not humans. What did they do? They took one man with a small little beard, cut his beard, pushed him in the center of town, put him on his hands and feet. A German put his foot just like that on his back and said to us, this is who you are. We will treat you like we treat a dog. I would say a dog we treated better. We got the message very clear. When we came upstairs to the house, my parents speak to each other. One more thing. The children understood right away, looking at the parents, that they can't help us. This is amazing to me because I've raised children and grandchildren and I look at children today. How was I to understand what's going on? I didn't understand the language, but I understood when I looked at my parents that they looked bewildered. Their eyes were wild. Their faces were sad. They, I understood that they can't help me. When I pulled on my father and said, why are they screaming? My father never ever screamed at, my, at me. He turned to me to the right and said, be quiet. I was shocked. Ever since then, I didn't say boo. I understood he can't help me. When we came up to the apartment, my father said to my mom, none of us are gonna make it unless we get help from the outside. There was no help, not right, left, up, low, none, none, 
you were on your own, whatever you were able to accomplish. My father, you want me to continue? Tell me, let me ask you a quick question. Just okay. let's remind us who you were living with. You were eight years old. You had an older sister, correct? Twelve and a half. She was four and a half years older than I. And were you going to school until the Germans came? I did not go to school. In Europe, they take children to school from seven, not from six. Well, so by the time the Germans walked in, I was probably not quite eight, must have been seven. No, my sister went to school. Yes, I did not. And did you, were you, were you a religious family? What was your family observing? My family was always orthodox. My father never changed. It was not extremely. He observed the Sabbath, went to synagogue. We ate kosher. That's always, this was, ne he never changed till the day he died. He died at 94. That's the way he was, even in hiding. When we went in hiding, he took with himself three things material that he saved from his store in case we need it, that's one side. His talit and his tefillin. You know the tefillin, did I say it right? Yeah. Wait, but Toby, before we get to being in hiding, uh, so tell us a little bit about the building. You live you lived with your parents in an apartment, but actually you were surrounded by family. Yes, in my, my building that we lived in the center, in the square. So there were stores on the bottom in the top apartments. That, you know, this is similar to here. So my paternal grandfather must have owned the building because all his children lived there, which is my aunt. My, we, had, we, had, we didn't have a big apartment, two rooms, a bedroom and a kitchen, I remember. Bathroom, I don't think we had bathrooms in the apartment. We had to go downstairs, outside. Okay, I remember that vividly. We had a beautiful stove though, and a big stove that you can bake all bread and, and holly and potato meat, everything that you want, you, that we had. So we had two rooms, each and my father's brother lived there, my, my father's two sisters lived there and my grandparents. My grand, mater, paternal grandmother, I do not remember, she must have died early, but I do remember my paternal grandfather very much. Toby, tell us about when you first went into hiding because you end up going into hiding twice. We went to hiding the first time, as I said, my father was right away counting on having help from the outside. My father was very well liked by Jews and non-Jews. He was a smart, intelligent, Good, very good human being till the day he died. He had great values teaching me the same value. So when he worked in the lumber yard, he was a slave labor. However, in the lumber yard worked not only slave laborers, but non-Jews, Poles and Ukrainians. Let me, let me just explain what you mean by that in case people don't understand. So what the Germans did was to press all the Jews into labor. And so that meant that you didn't get to choose what you did. You weren't paid for what you did. And often the labor was, I mean, in a way, almost the, the way we think about Egypt, because it was backbreaking and in some degree degrading just to be degrading. And so the Jews were put to work and the work was work uh, and it was extremely, extremely difficult, but not as difficult as what was to come. Correct. Thank you. I need you. I need you everywhere I go now. I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> small kids, smaller young kids need explanation like that. You're right. But I never have enough time to do it. That's my problem. It, it's anyway. just because your story is so large. Just so my father was, again, I'm repeating, he counted on his neighbors to help him. And they did. One of his neighbors come, that worked in the lumber yard, he was a free man. He got paid. He wasn't a slave labor. He was not beaten when he didn't do right. One guy comes over. My father's name was Moshe. 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 He said, Moshe, Eisenstein was his name. It's going to be a big aktia. Aktia means actually dragging you out, pulling you and killing you if you don't want to go, killing you on the spot or else you follow their rules. He says, it's going to be a big aktia. You better find a good hiding place. My father had time to find a hiding place and he did. Do you want me to explain the hiding place? It takes time that hiding place. It's an amazing hiding place for me. 
My father was a simple man, but he was very bright. In Europe, we have their basement is not like here. You come from inside the house in the basement. No, a, ba a cellar. In Europe, it's called a cellar. You go into the cellar from on, from the street. It has a big, heavy steel door. And it's a full flight down, all the way down, a full flight. It's cold there. Don't forget, we did not have refrigerators either, okay? So you storage everything in those cellars. What did my father figure out? He'll make a, a new wall in the cellar to get into that cellar, not from the street because people will see from the inside of his sister's apartment. He figured out exactly how to do it. And then he, when he built, where did he get the stuff to build? He was working on a lumber yard. He was stealing the, lum, the lumber. He was stealing the bricks and, and murder. Sure enough, once they caught him, they took him on the Gestapo. He had never seen anybody beaten up like my father was beaten up that day. He never came home. My mom had to go look for him. When she found him, he was half dead. When she brought him home, he knew he can't stay home more than a day because if he does, they'll pick him up and put him on the train and send him away. So he went to work two days later. Then he went back to his building, finished his hiding place. And to get into the hiding place, he did it from his sister's apartment underneath the stove. He cut out a hole enough for us to roll down and get inside. Then he built the platform. To me, he, I, how he did it and under those circumstances is, is amazing how he was able to accomplish. Sure enough, we had that place to go. When this guy came to, comes to my father and says to him, I think it's going to be that weekend, you better go and hide in Friday. Sure enough, Friday we go into hiding into that place. So it was four of us and my father's sister and three children, two boys and an infant baby girl. My aunt took her long pillow to cover the baby in case she cries. My paternal Paternal grandfather lived with my aunt on the ground floor. He did not want to go. He said, I'd rather die now than see you killed. He stayed in the apartment. We all went in hiding. He was able, to, when you came into the kitchen, you could not see that there was anything moved different. The hole was underneath the stove. And when we all got inside, it was like a, a square and then the square was a chain. He pulled the chain down. The square was covered. You could not see on the floor or anything. Was it completely dark inside? Completely. Pitch, pitch dark, pitch. And, how, and so pitch. you're there, you're there with nine people. Nine people. For how many days? One day only, but we stayed extra. But one day was the killing. Saturday, a whole day. Sure enough, Saturday morning, we hear the German with the, with the dogs, with the Ukrainians, Ukraine police and the German walking and screaming, picking up the people. In the afternoon, they come into my aunt's apartment when my grandfather was there and they say to him, come. He says, no, they had no problem shooting him right there. We heard it. We heard when my grandfather was shot. Very, very, we thought we got away from it. They didn't look for us, but very, very late in the afternoon, the big cellar door opens up and the Germans started walking. I was not the youngest, but I was too far away from my mom, I guess, because all I did very quietly, the fear of hearing them knocking with the boots and the dogs, all I did was say, just very quiet, just like this, uh, uh, just like that. My mom grabbed my hand, so I kept quiet, but they heard a noise. So they started going down the stairs with the flashlight. My aunt put a pillow on the infant. She shouldn't scream, scream. We stopped breathing. By the time in the middle of the, of the stairs going down, a big cat jumps out and gives a big meow. The Germans looked at each other and said in German, it's only a nekatsi, it's only a cat. 
they turned around and walked right out. We realized we made it that time. We didn't know when to come out because we didn't know when it's finished. We didn't hear. So we stayed another day, another day. My, my aunt, my mom's sister, she made it. So she, she knew where some place in the house, but didn't know where. So she came looking and screaming, it's all over. Don't worry, come out. That's when we came out. That, so ahead. I want to, and I want to take us to the next hiding place, because of course your father realizes that he has protected you this time, but that that's not going to be enough. Oh. And that you need some place that you can stay for far longer. And he ends up finding a woman who had known him uh, his whole life, a woman named Stephanie in town who had a barn in the back of her house. Tell us about the barn and tell us about Stephanie. I want to first tell you why my father did it. Okay. The Germans use, it's very important for me because you I'm teaching children not to believe everything. I'm teaching children to look into it. Don't believe everything you hear. Every, every level I teach them to children. My, so the Germans used language of deception. They tell you something, but we were slaves. We had no choice to follow because no way did I have any place else to go. Nobody let me in and nobody helped me. No, the whole world didn't care. What can I tell you? So they said they're going to relocate the remaining Jews to Lviv, the big city, because there's a big Jewish ghetto there. It made sense. But my father says, I don't believe them. I'm not going to follow them. This is important for me. Because had he followed, I would never have been here. So what are you going to do? Every, my, my mom asked, my aunt asked. So my, by that time, my father's family was all gone. My mom's family, she still had a sister. She had two brothers. One was married, one was single. So my father explaining to them that I don't believe them. What are you going to do, Moshe? He says, I'm going to look for someone to hide us. He finds Stephanie and how many people. So the two brothers, my, my uncles said, no, they're going to follow to the big city, to the ghetto. They don't want to look because it's not going to be possible. My father said, no, he kept his word. He found Stephanie. My aunt said, we'll go together. So we'll be going. So she, Stephanie had a house on Main Street as you pass the Main Street in the city. But every house in Europe has a garden. After the garden is a barn. Barn is made from panels. You know, it's all open, not big. So she said, where are we? So my father said, where are we gonna hide? He said, you have a barn. She said, yes. He said, I'll make a smaller divider for us. So we were nine people. So he made, a, I want you to picture, four feet by five feet. Each person sleeping head and toe, head and toe. If one person had to turn at night, every, all of nine of us had to turn. We, us children and women went in hiding. When the barn was ready, went in hiding earlier. And he gave her one sack of material. We had no money to give her. She did it without money. He gave her a sack of material because material you can buy and have money to buy for food. And he said to her, buy livestock. So that will give you an excuse to bring food to the barn. So she bought a pig, a pig and chickens, put them in one corner and we in the other corner. That's where we were. That's so then after women went first in hiding, then the men. Sure enough, when it came to the last, when the Germans came to the last minute picking up the people to put them on the trains to take them to Le Bourg, people must have realized that the Germans lied because everybody was running in different directions. It was a chaos but they picked the majority, whatever they didn't. My father and uncle barely made it to the hiding place, but they did. So we were nine people in that hiding place. Two weeks later, Stephanie comes to tell us there isn't a single Jew left in Chodov. Jews lived in Chodov, I'm not exaggerating, for under a thousand years. All of a sudden, there isn't a single Jew there. 
sit still. Of course we did. That's where we sat for two years. We but actually did. in the middle of that. Right. Uh, was, yes, you're right. I'm going to, this is very important. In, in the middle of that, a Ukrainian police officer comes to the barn. Tell us what happened then. Okay. It was about three months into the hiding. Three people are standing and stretching their legs. The remaining are sitting there and looking out with their heads like this. The big dark barn, though, in the barn, you have to remember, is pitch dark. Pitch dark. That's it. All 24 hours dark. The big barn door opens up. Stephanie's in the middle, the sun is busting in. We are standing three people. She's standing in the middle and a Ukrainian police, not a German, a Ukrainian police right next on the right hand side. I will never ever forget that sight. She sees three of us standing, she freezes. The, the pig sees light, light, the pig and chicken start running towards the door. He was blinded. You can call it a miracle. You can call it, it was meant for, my father said it, it was meant someone to survive. He always said, someone has to survive. So he used to say, this is our way of surviving. Someone has to survive to tell the world. He did not see us. He's looking at the picking chickens. They running towards him. Finally, she closes the door, goes away, comes back a couple of hours later and tells us, you have to leave. I'm scared. My kids don't know about you. He saw you. My father was begging her. No, he didn't see us because the sun blinded him, whatever the reason. She says, no, no, no. We have to leave. We have to leave. She gives us two nights. So where do we decide to go? To the forest. It's, not, it's we are in the middle of town. We have to pass the other half town, pass a small little um, water, not a big deep water. We can cross it and another walk, and then will be the forest. Nine people to walk to the forest. We have a very small chance making it, but we have no choice. As we're getting dressed to go, my father turns to my mom and says. Betty is old enough to do something different. So what does he do? So my mom turns to me and says to me, Toby, from now on, you listen to Betty. You know what? I was eight years old. I learned to obey. I'm still obeying. So I grab my sister's hand and I know she's going to be in charge of me now. My father turns to my sister and says, here's three addresses. Polish people, I know they will, one of you will hide you. I know, he said to her clearly, I know the war will end. I don't know when. If we don't come back, I know there are going to be people looking for others that survive. And then he gives the addresses if, we, if, if he doesn't come back to Palestine. I had an aunt, my mom's sister, my father had a brother. They got out of Khodorov in 1937 to Palestine. They had a visa. They, were, they belonged to the, to the um, Zionist organization. They were able to get a visa. So they were wound up in, this, in Palestine. Then he gave her addresses from cousins the United States. The rest of us were planning to go to the farms. Stephanie, on the other hand, she knows we're leaving she was, I, I don't think she was, we didn't look at her as a human. We looked at her as a savior, our savior. You know, we never called her by her name. We called her the Pritze. Pritze means the queen, the savior. We, she, was, she, I was, she was our savior. She realized that we're leaving tonight and she felt guilty. So she goes to the Ukraine and says to him, you know who I am, you know my family, you know my husband was taken away with the Russians, you should have pity on me. So why, why did you come to, to, what did you, looking for, why did you come? He says, Mrs. Strzok, you bought livestock, my job is to register it. I registered it. 
She asks him over and over the same. He gives her the same questions. So she leaves his house and realizes he did not see us. She walks home, comes home. She has two children, a 19-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. His name was Tajik. She tells the children what we what happened the afternoon and what that we're leaving tonight. What she has nine Jews in hiding. And then we're leaving. The 16-year-old boy, 16, I want you to remember, 16, turns to mom and says, You can't chase them. I will help you. Maybe together we will save them. The mom said no. He said yes. They went on a come. And then he turns to the sister and says, you stay out of it because you socializing with the Germans, you might slip. Me and mom, I will never forget that face. He opens up the bundle and says to us, my name is Stajik. You're not going any place. I will make a better hiding. This is not a place to sit. And we'll try to save you. He made a, a, one layer higher. He put a lot of hay because barns is open panels, so it's cold. And the bedding that we gave her to hide, she gave it back to us to have because it's cold. That's where we sat for two years. Toby, I'm, I'm conscious. Wait, I'm conscious of time, um, and I just think that's an amazing anecdote to to start to um, to wind ourselves down on because we could talk for hours. And I just want you to, first of all, I think that the note of understanding that the 16 year old boy was instrumental to saving nine people. I just want you to remind everybody who was in there that you were with nine people for two years. And even though they expanded the space, it was still extremely, extremely small. What did you eat? And did you go to school while you were in there? school we didn't go in the street we sat inside i had no bed for two years the food was i was hungry all the time the only food she could give us was bread and potatoes that's and wasn't enough and i will never okay we don't have time i know i can't get involved too much the place must have been i don't know if it was i can't i it was a square little nothing. We couldn't walk, only get up a little bit, go to the, so what us four children, we, in, one, in one of the panels, we would look out and see the world. What we did inside, my father tried to teach us, to talk to us. He taught me the alphabet. He taught me to speak in, in, in Yiddish and to read. He taught me the multiplication table and he was teaching me not to hate. He said, if we make it, you, you will, I used to ask him why, why are we sitting? What did you do wrong? He said, I don't know why the hatred is so great on the Jews, but if you make it and you learn, maybe you can teach. Well, I made it and I'm learning and I'm teaching. I don't understand why the hatred of the Jews is so big. Why the, the churches in, it's true. The churches in Europe preach hatred for the Jews, but not in America. So why is America now anti-Semitic? Not as bad, but it's, it's bad enough for me to remind me. In I'm order Go ahead. You, you said. No, no. Let's let's not go to that point because I think that's too big of a, a point to 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 okay. wrap up with. I just um, first of all, I want to. You can keep going for another five minutes. Oh, okay, great. So, Toby, I I you know I, I I think we could spend hours on the time and confinement. No, I know. But you were you were, you were you were liberated. You were liberated in in 1944, 1944. when the Russians, the Russians. And I just want to actually let the middle schoolers here that you then, your life did not normalize. You then were taken to DP camps. Those are displaced persons camps. Okay. For a number of years, it wasn't at all clear where you would end up living. Where were, where was the DP camp you were in? I was in Austria. And for how many years were you there? From 1945 when the war ended, just like my father predicted they'll look for survivors, they did, picked up from every town. My town, 
31 Jews survived all in the hiding. Nobody came back from any place. If and and out, out of how many thousand, a couple of thousand Jews, correct? Caught it approximately under 5,000, but the vicinity had also. Right. So from 45, I wound up in Austria, 45, 1949, four years. That's where I had schooling. But we, I didn't have a normal life. We lived in the army barracks. The bathroom was in one corner, the kitchen, the other. But I had freedom, freedom to walk freedom to learn, to socialize with children. To me, it was the best years of my life. I was 12, I was, I came when 1949, when all the doors opened up in the world to allow all these refugees to come. We came to United States. I didn't come to the North, I came to New Orleans. My father was always different. He never goes where everybody else goes. Everybody goes, see, says, I go there. I, but I will never forget the experience coming to New Orleans. I have to say, the Jews weren't there for us during the war, but they were there for us from 45 on to support us because we couldn't work. There was no way anybody could work. We lived in DP camps, but we came to the United States. Again, we were helped by the Jewish agents, the Joint and the Hayas. I just want to make sure the kids understand exactly what you're talking about. So for several years after the war, all these Jewish refugees, the few people who had survived, end up in camps. I mean, but they're not concentration camps, but they're camps. It's a little like living in camp, but not nearly as posh. They live in barracks and sometimes actually in places where there had been concentration camps like Bergen-Belsen. They were put in camps for several years. People married, they had children, they set up schools because it was not clear which countries would take in Jewish refugees. Obviously, Israel wasn't established until 1948. So until those years, until that year, it was not clear if people could go. The United States still had quotas. Around the world, people were clamoring to get into new countries. People went to Australia, people went to Canada. But for several years, Jews like Toby and her family were in limbo. Uh, but for Toby, which I think is amazing of your story, is that it's the first time you actually get to be a kid. Right. First time. You're right. I played the same games that I used to watch the children playing outside. I learned to walk, to talk, to laugh, to laugh, to sneeze. I used to sneeze to close my nose. We had to learn all these things. We had school right away. We had Israeli teachers. We learned Hebrew, we learned the language. We went hiking. Best years of my life as a teen, as a child. I took Toby, we have one minute left and it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day and this is a Jewish day school in DC. Um, what's your parting message to this group? That you have the freedom here to enjoy a Jewish life, get educated in Judaism. Don't allow whatever happened before. Be part of Jews. Understand, you have to understand in order to answer someone that's going to deny. That's why I do that. I want you to be my witness. You, you I, I rely on you. I didn't do enough of a job, looks like. And my father thought I will do the job. Now I'm relying on you to get educated in Judaism so you can fight anti-Semitism in order. Jews cannot fight it alone. You need the other side to help, but the Jewish have to understand how to fight. Please be my witness and I wish you a great good year, but I have hope. Why? Because we have an Israel. So I'm always hopeful. Just like the virus, I always say there's at the end, I see the end of the tunnel. I see the, the virus, the end of the tunnel. I had my first vaccine, so I'm more relaxed a little bit. I try not to do what I do. And I try to tell people, wear your mask, don't socialize, don't go out. To, I have not gone out to dinner for the past 11 months. So the same thing is I'm looking at the virus at the almost at the end. So staying home to me is not a big deal because I have the freedom to go out and in. So the virus to me hit me in a different way. Here I have the freedom I can do. There I had no freedom, not freedom to talk. 
at least they're helping to talk now. So I want you, I want a lot out of you kids. If you ever want me again, I'll do it again with you because I know time is not on my side. When I'm I, sorry to cut you off, but I, I know, know, I know, I know, I know. That's why I said, I, I know myself. Did I give you enough kids? Are you going to be my witness? Yes? Yes? I think they're on mute. I think they're on mute. I know they're on I see they're on mute. They're on mute, but they all say yes. On mute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Call a kavod. I give you credit, kids. Keep it up. It's you who are going to keep it up, not me. I'm in my end of it. How old am I? 87. Wow. <laughs> Great, great. See, many kids can't figure it out. <laughs> yes, don't laugh. Right. Yeah. No guessing. Well, thank you so much. This I want been... you to know that the virus is, is, is temporary at the end of it. So you'll have a lot. I know it's. it's Come on. <laughs> I did okay? Yeah, thank that you. Was, that was so moving, thank so meaningful. So Thank you. Can everyone say a big thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions you can mail them in. I'd be delighted to answer them. Okay. Is that a deal? Yeah. We'll, we'll give out your email. Take a look at it. Letters. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure this is one. Thank you. You and I are coming later. Thank you so much.